News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. The coronavirus has affected the daily lives of Idahoans in every corner of the state, although cases of infection have not been confirmed in every county. One of the hardest hit areas has been Blaine County, which had Idaho's first case of community spread. It now has the second highest number of confirmed cases behind only Ada. And according to multiple reports early on in the pandemic, Blaine had one of, if not the highest rates of infection in the entire country per capita. This fact has caught the attention of the National Institutes of Health. An intensive study will be done there. As of Thursday afternoon, there were 477 confirmed cases and five deaths in Blaine County. My guest today is State Senator Michelle Stennett. She is the Senate Minority Leader and represents Blaine, Camas, Gooding, and Lincoln counties. However, she has been hunkered down at home in Ketchum since the governor's stay-at-home order took effect back on March 25th, following the rules like most Idahoans. Uh, hello, Senator, and, and thank you for your time today. Thank you for the invitation. So happy to be here. Well, so first of all, just how are you doing under the circumstances? Well, it's... Uh it's wonderful, actually. I, I was able to be home, get a few home projects done, but beyond that, it has been incredibly busy trying to make sure that we get resources and answer questions, both from federal agencies and state agencies, um, trying to dispense as much uh, help and provision to everybody in the county and the district as I can. And so it has been incredibly busy, but uh, everybody is following the rules and trying to make sure to make the best of it and ready for spring. And we'll talk a little bit more about life in Blaine County in just a little bit, but I do want to talk about the NIH study. What is the National Institutes of Health going to be doing in Blaine County? Well, the National Institutes of Health are, um, they are working around the country to make sure that they pull, pull together what they call epi teams. And they are looking for serology or an ability to see in the blood what indicates an infection. And we tend to be more isolated and have a high infection rate and the right amount of population to do a good research project here. So we have been working with the doctors um, that have been in the first line of, of this infection here in the county and spoke with the National Institutes for Health to have the ability for them to do research here. And it's looking promising that they'll be here in the next couple of weeks to um, be able to test a large uh, portion of the population and get some real data and research out of it that will hopefully help us understand the virus better. How will it work? Will it be, uh, will it be random? Will it be blood draws? It will be both. I'm told that in order to get a good research, it has to have randomness um, so that all populations and all demographics are tested. But it will be a blood draw from my understand. And I think there are two types of testing. You, you've probably heard about either the finger pricking or uh, the blood draw. And I understand that there, this would be a blood draw type. And uh, beyond that, um, I haven't had a chance to look at the protocols that they've set up. But I'm very excited that if we could lend any kind of information to um, the overall understanding of this virus, it would be wonderful that Blaine County would be able to, one, be tested, but also be a resource um, in the future for understanding this virus better. And you touched on it a little while ago. But what is the NIH team going to be looking for? Is it that um, the rate of spread and, and how contagious it is and maybe even possibly for use for a vaccine? Well, what they're gonna be looking for is critical epi epidemiological data. Um, I'm learning how to say that better. But uh, what they do is they, they are looking for the rate of infection. So they're doing this in what they call um, a sero survey or a serology report, which is checking for antibodies in people. So if you've been exposed, um, either a current infection, um, which is what a lot of the tests early on were to see if you're actively infected, which is when you're a big carrier, when you have the virus within you, but also post carrier further on down weeks later when you still have the antibody in you. There's so little understanding about how long the immunity stays in our system. And um, so it's really both the active and also post. And what they're testing for is whether a person has an an the COVID antibody in their system. So is this a definite that the NIH team will be coming here or is it under consideration? As far as I was last told um, that they, we are um, 
we it, it is definite what they have to do to do a good research project is to put the protocols together put their epi team together get the resources and then they'll come over so we are working on making sure um, however it is they're going to do the testing that we have provided either a location or an ability for them to invite the community to be tested we would have to make sure that they had transportation to get around those sorts of things uh, it's it's typical for uh, either the CDC or the NIH to ask to be invited by the state. So our state um, mm -hmm. uh, health and welfare department is knowledgeable about this and then to also have the county aware so that we make sure that they have the resources they need to do this well. And will this be using the uh, tests that have, have been approved by the FDA? Yes, my understanding is there are a lot of tests on the market, but many of them are very uh, experimental. So the CDC and the NIH are using those tests that the FDA has already approved. I understand there are four of them. Some of them test both both the um, the and there's IgGs and IgMs and all of this um, in scientific terms, but the early active and also post antibody in the system. Um, I believe that the NIH will be using one where you're testing both at the same time. And so they want to be able to get as much information from each person about um, the, the, the activity within the person's system, but also the longevity of the antibody in a person. Thank you, Senator, for explaining how that whole test, the research project is gonna work. I wanna talk now a little bit more about life in, in Blaine County. As I mentioned earlier, it was one of the hardest hit areas, first place to have community spread. No tourists are traveling there right now. Residents are staying home as much as possible. How would you describe life there right now? And, and as we talk about that, I wanna show pictures that you sent me of Ketchum and Bellevue looking very deserted. It is unusual and unnerving <laughs> to see how little activity because understanding we are going into a slack season anyway, but this has been this way for a month of um, being very quiet. And of course, Blaine County had a more rigorous uh, isolation and, and quarantine than the rest of the state for a while. So we didn't even have landscapers or people working in the construction uh, industry. We were the first to put out that we wanted people not to come in or if they did, they quarantined for two weeks. Um, really discouraging any kind of tourism to come in because of our rate of infection for the safety of our people, but also for the safety of people who are coming in. That is now lightened up um, that the community and count, all the communities within Blaine County are following the same kind of protocols that the rest of the state is. And I was um, having a good giggle this morning because I went out this morning and the landscapers and construction workers and busy trucks and construction trucks and everything is going everywhere right now. I think they were ready to get back to work, happy to lighten the load a little bit on the economy and making that transition back um, slowly under the protocols that the governor has just issued to us. But we wanna make sure that we are um, trying to do this as carefully, but managing to bring an economy and, and, and employment back to our people in the county. Yeah, and um, you know, at that area, Sun Valley, the Wood River Valley is so well known for uh, tourism. It seems like it's gonna be a while. It must be somewhat disheartening to know that it's gonna take a while to bring all that back. We were just having a meeting. Um, it was a virtual town hall meeting with um, our doctors, with commissioners, with the public health sector last night. And the economy, um, we're told we're at about 23% unemployment right now. Um, of course, um, the actual activity is about down about two thirds. It is, uh, we normally are quiet, like I said, but we usually have good tourism even up until now. Um, but that has been, um, can't, most everything was canceled in March, which we had a lot of large groups come in. So mm -hmm. that certainly had an economic hit. Of course, the local option tax that, that the, the um, uh, uh, resort communities are capable of gathering through the sales um, is down dramatically. So as we come forward, there's gonna be a lot of economic adjustment um, in order to bring ourselves back online. And even going into the summer, we've canceled a lot of large group gatherings that are typical, the Allen and Company, um, our, uh, our film festivals, uh, many of those things that bring a lot of gatherings have either been postponed to the later part of the summer or put, or canceled altogether. And we're just going to have to adjust. This will be something we haven't seen for quite some time. 
So what concerns and questions are you getting from your constituents? When we were talking, you said you spend many hours a day on the phone. Well, it's everything you can think of. Um, I, part of what we do, um, what my job is to do is I know who to reach and what phone numbers and what uh, websites um, that resources are coming from that allow me to be able to direct somebody immediately to whatever their concern or need is. And so there's been a lot of phone calls and emails going around about that. Putting together large lists on our email networks and across the state, but also within the county where you can find your unemployment or, or small business loans, um, everything from where childcare is, how can you get mental health services? Um, how do we do the census at the 2020 census? There's going to be a primary. How do I get online to do a mail-in uh, ballot? Um, things that are, are new and out of the ordinary mm -hmm. and it runs everything you can think of that a person needs to lead a life that we get those questions and we just try to make sure that we can get them the best uh, information and resources we can right now. And about the one minute we have left for this first segment, um, can you tell me what the Blaine Recovery Committee is? Yes, it's a brand new committee that's put together. Um, it's had a, a couple weeks of meetings um, and what it is is it's a, built on a template that is a re long term recovery idea that's happened during disasters that's happened all over the country. And we had a short term one when we've had fi our fires, but once the fire is put out, then you don't really need to look much beyond that. And this obviously is gonna be until we find a vaccination. So how do we put all of our resources together, whether it's the business sector or the healthcare sector, um, who all can participate from the nonprofits and how do we make sure that we move out of this working together with all of our ability and, and resources and knowledge and, um, and, and smarts in order to bring us along over the long term. And so um, it is a, a think tank, but also pooling all of their resources, um, a lot of uh, different sectors of the economy and also um, many, just work, all the groups you can think of who make the county uh, operate are part of this so that we can help each other move into a transition of more normalcy as we go forward. We're going to take a time out right here, Senator. And so coming up after the break, we'll continue the conversation with Senator Stennett. And when we come back, her take on the state's overall response to the pandemic, including the governor's latest decisions. How did Peterson Auto Group become the number one place to buy or service a car in Treasure Valley? Friendly service, a wide selection, and great prices. Peterson Auto Group, 10 brands, 5 locations, all in one spot. PetersonCars.com Idaho has given you a place to dream, a place to learn, endless places to roam, friendship, hope, and so much more. Idaho Gives is designed to raise money and awareness for Idaho nonprofits and is all online. Nonprofits have a major impact on our state and deserve our support. Please go to IdahoGives.org and donate April 23rd through May 7th to the causes you care about. What can you give Idaho? Idaho's makers are putting their skills to work to help Idaho during the COVID-19 crisis. Producing personal protective equipment at home for healthcare professionals, essential workers, and at-risk populations. Is your organization in need? We want to hear how Idaho's makers can help you. Text MAKE to 208-321-5614. We'll send you a link where you can tell what we can make for you. KTVB, the STEM Action Center, and Idaho's makers want to help. Have you ever walked along an Idaho trail or fished in an Idaho stream? Have you attended a live performance or watched your kids swim in one of our many lakes? Nonprofits are on the front lines every single day, making sure that we have access to all that Idaho has to offer. And now more than ever, they need our support. Please give back to Idaho. Donate to an Idaho nonprofit now through May 7th at IdahoGives.org. Thank you for voting Peterson Auto Group the number one place to buy and service a car in Treasure Valley. Shop one of our 10 trusted brands at Peterson Auto Group. 10 brands, 5 locations, all in one spot. PetersonCars.com 
And welcome back to Viewpoint. We've been focusing today on life in Blaine County, one of the areas hit hardest by the coronavirus in Idaho. Now we're going to turn to the state's overall response to the crisis with my guest, Idaho Senate Min Minority Leader Michelle Stennett of Ketchum. Senator Governor Brad Little announced a four step plan to reopen Idaho's economy. It could take two months, if not longer, depending on whether people keep meeting the criteria to be able to open and reopen other businesses. So what do you think about the plan that the governor rolled out this week? I think it was very thoughtful, uh, doing it in segments about every couple of weeks, understanding that the, those types of businesses where everybody has to congregate closely or there needs a certain degree of tactileness have to be considered later as we see um, how well we do the rollout. But I think it was is time to start making very gradual um, differences and, and transitions into bringing business back online and then making sure we pause and make sure that that uh, we're holding our own as far as infection and the cases stay down and it stays flatlined or improves. And then if it doesn't and we have to hold it back a little bit, I. I, I really believe his plan was um, about as thoughtful as you can do it and still try to make sure that the economy comes back online, that uh, people can um, get back to some degree, small degree of normalcy, uh, little by little, and then have that roll out if everything goes well by the end of June, and then we can um, hopefully see how we fare over the summer. You know, we're starting to see more protests of people wanting things to open up much more quickly. What do you say to those who are, who are protesting and really pushing the governor to, to do it faster? I completely understand and sympathize that if you are home and you are worried about whether you're gonna make your rent and whether you're gonna put food on the table and you're de depending on a community to bring you um, resources, you're not sure, that insecurity panic is uh, at the heart of making sure that you are trying to do the best for your family and your community, but you you have to get back to work because there are just not a lot of options. You don't have um, a lot saved or um, you just, the, the push to be able to get back to normal is uh, a, a very palpable one and I completely understand. At the same time, we don't want to get reinfected at the rate that I saw in Blaine County um, because you put everybody else at risk around you, including your own family. So making, and then we have to remember that many of these places don't have any healthcare, um, no hospitals, not a lot of healthcare providers. So if something were to happen in, in real rural communities, they would be ill prepared to manage the type of infection that we saw in our county. So I think to be more thoughtful, and frankly, I think you've done some surveys around the state, and I know they've done it around the nation, the greater majority of the population wants us to be methodical and thoughtful, do move forward, but do it in a respectful, respectful and responsible manner. And I think that this is the best we can do and can, by containing uh, the virus, but still managing to bring the economy online. What do you think of the state's overall response to the crisis from the beginning? Did we act soon enough, too late, too early? Is, do you think this is all gonna last too long in terms of restrictions? It's so hard to say what to anticipate because this is unprecedented. Some people would have argued that maybe we should have managed the schools a little earlier, but it ended up that they've been out, they will be out the rest of the academic year. So how do you manage that and still do the kind of education and learning that is required within a good school system? Otherwise, um, the governor has been following the protocols of the CDC and, um, and the president um, from, from the federal level. Um, to the best of his ability, and I think that was the the best practices we had for the moment. And I think so far, as far as Idaho is concerned, people have managed to do what we've asked as far as good hygiene and making sure that we do our physical distancing. And and still, it, we're so fortunate in Idaho to be able to get mm -hmm. out and do some physical and mental wellness type of things. Um, it is a, a new existence, but I, I think so far what we've seen is the the rollout and the way we manage this has served us um, it is hard to say how long to do it um, and they say until a vaccine but if we see that we're if we're doing everything according to the protocols that the governor is going to lay out for us as we open up businesses and we manage to hold our own then i think we've made the, the right choices and are on the right path 
Um, what role have, have you been able to play in this decision-making process as minority leader uh, and working with the administration? I have been fortunate to be able to have regular meetings with the, governor's, the governor and his staff to have our input. Um, the, uh, the, the blessing and the curse, I guess, of having Blaine County be the first to roll out um, and have the infection is also the good things that we can be the beacon if we do this well of managing into the next um, cycle of getting back to some kind of normalcy. And so the better we do it within my district and within this county and do it well, hopefully that can be replicated in other parts of the state. Um, but we are doing this um, a little blindly, but with the best science and knowledge that we have. And uh, the governor and um, particularly uh, his uh, uh, lead uh, medical director and director Jepson and those that are in the health and welfare department um, giving us information, it, it has been very collaborative and I've been pleased with the ability to participate and bring whatever they have to um, my district. A final thought for folks as we wrap up the interview, what would you like to leave people with as we head into what could be the next chapter of this recovery? We all have to remember to be patient, um, take advantage of the beautiful weather and um, remember that the people that we love who are close to us, our families, our friends, our communities are here with us. We're doing this together. The best way to come out of this is to uh, Always remember to have an act of kindness. Try to bring a smile to your face. Take the best and higher road you can possibly do with this. Um, be as helpful as possible. And in the end, we um, we are just in this together. And perhaps uh, it'll teach us all uh, a, a new way of making sure that uh, life is precious and the people we care about are special and that our communities stay strong. Senator Michelle Stennett, thank you so much for your time today. Um, my best to you and your friends and neighbors and uh, be well and take care. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And we hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. Well, have you filled up your gas tank recently? You no doubt notice you're not paying nearly as much per gallon as just a few short weeks ago. Next on Viewpoint, the good and the bad of the plummeting prices at the pumps. Clog gutters don't just look bad, they attract birds, rodents, mosquitoes, and other insects. So replace those old gutters with LeafGuard, the gutter that never clogs, guaranteed. It's the only patented, one-piece seamless system, and it's earned a good housekeeping seal 15 years in a row. LeafGuard lets the rain in and keeps the leaves, twigs, pine needles, and other debris out. It looks great with 14 colors to choose from. And with our fascia wrap, you get added beauty and protection with a secure foundation to attach LeafGuard. It's our $99 install sale. Call now for $99 installation on a complete LeafGuard system. Plus, choose 25 months no interest or a $400 Lowe's gift card with your LeafGuard purchase. And call during this program for dinner to go on us. Receive a free $50 gift card with your in-home estimate. Don't miss out on our $99 install sale. Call LeafGuard now. Would you like to replace your old tub with a beautiful walk-in shower? Let Bath Planet change it today. Our experts will remove your old tub and wall surrounds all the way down to the framing and install a safe, low-maintenance, and gorgeous shower in less than two days. Get a free in-home or video consultation over your computer or smartphone and take advantage of our incredible no payments and no interest for 18 months offer. Bath Planet of Southern Idaho. Normally, Idaho Gives is a single day of giving when Idahoans reach out to local nonprofits. But as you know, this is no ordinary year. And this year, we're going to need to help each other out even more because so many are in need. So if you're able to give even just a little, please join us. Go to IdahoGives.org today and give. Crude oil prices in the U.S. dropped below zero per barrel this past week for the first time ever. 
The drop in demand due to stay at home orders around the world is pushing down oil and gas prices. In some places in Idaho, you'll pay about $1.70 per gallon. But there are two sides to this situation. On one hand, the low gas prices are good for consumers and their wallets, of course, but it's costing local businesses. Misty England has the story. Currently, gas prices in Idaho are under $2 per gallon on average, according to AAA. On the surface, that may look like a good thing, but you know the saying. Be careful what you wish for. And it's true, low gas prices are good for consumers. But Charlie Jones, president and owner of the Idaho-based Stinker Stores chain, says lower demand at the pumps means that business currently, well, stinks. The public is not going to school, not going to work not doing a lot of the things they normally do. So we're selling half the amount of gasoline that we sold a year ago. Locally owned on the fly is seeing a similar drop in business. We're actually at about 50% of our normal gas sales. However, it's not all bad news for local gas stations. Jones says they have actually seen a slight uptick with in-store sales. We've seen uh, that ring go from an average sale of many of our stores, five or six dollars per customer up to eight, nine or ten dollars per customer. With bars and dine-in restaurants closed, both Stinker and On The Fly have also seen a rise in alcohol sales. Almost 40 to 45 percent of our daily sales are alcohol and alcohol alone. Normally it's about 35 percent, so we've seen a big spike in uh, alcohol purchases. So what does the future look like for these local gas stations? Are gas stations in smaller communities? that uh, are marginal already as far as profitability. Um, I and any other businessman uh, will uh, take short term losses, but long term uh, we have to make money. After this settles out, there will likely be fewer gas stations in the smaller towns. With our particular situation, you know, we have multiple stores and, you know, we are pretty diversified. So I think in our particular instance, you know, we'll be able to weather the storm. And, and I think once once all this is said and done, I think business is just going to pick up right where it was or even just blast off. Stinker Stores has 65 locations in Idaho and 1,000 employees company-wide. Jones says they have had to temporarily furlough about 20 employees and reduce hours. But nobody has been laid off and no stores have shut down. On the fly has cut back some hours for employees as well. That's all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. Until next time, be safe and be well.